Good morning. Good morning. Good afternoon and good, good evening, afternoon. To, where, uh, to, our, uh, to our dear audience. My name is Murugi Dirango, and I'm the director of Columbia Global Centers, Nairobi. It is my pleasure to welcome you today for the fourth conversation of Entrenu, an interdisciplinary series featuring dialogue between scholars, journalists, and artists from around the world. The American Library in Paris, the Institute for Ideas and Imagination, and the Columbia Global Centers Paris and Nairobi are honored to collaborate on this series. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce a conversation on the intersection of artistry and activism. Robert Omiele and Anthony Mwangi, otherwise known as Antonio Sol, will discuss music, globalization, freedom of expression, politics, and social justice. Let me now introduce our speakers. Professor Robert G. Omiele is the Zora Neale Huston Professor of English and Comparative Literature at Columbia University. He is the founder and director of Columbia Center for Jazz Studies. Omiele is the author of The Craft of Ralph Ellingson, Lady Day, The Many Faces of Billie Holiday, The Jazz Singers, Romeo Bearden, A Black Odyssey. He has several edited volumes, including The Jazz Cadence of American Culture. For his production, of a Smithsonian record set called The Jazz Singers, he was nominated for a Grammy Award. Omiele has co -cur uh, curated exhibition for the Smithsonian Institution, Jazz at Lincoln Center, and the High Museum of Art in Atlanta. He has held Guggenheim and Kalman Fellowships and was a recent fellow at Columbia's Institute for Ideas and Imagination at the Columbia Global Centers in Paris. Anthony Mwangi, otherwise known as Antonio Sol, is a musician, television host, and a radio presenter who was named as one of 100 most influential Kenyans by Avon's media. A socially engaged artist and mentor, he has participated in a number of international workshops and conferences, such as the Mashariki Creative Economy Impact Investment Conference, Copyright 10 at Harvard uh, Law School and the Go Down Art Center Connect for Culture in 2020. He also played a role in Sugar in 2012 alongside Lupita Nyong'o. His debut album, Starborn, was released in 2014 and his sophomore album, Welcome to My Soul, will be out in 2022. We hope the series is as inspiring for you as it has been for us creating it. Let me hand it over now to Bob Omiele to start off the conversation. Welcome, Bob. Hello, everyone. I'm, I'm glad to, to be here and to thank my partners, especially Marugi uh, and, and all my, our partners uh, everywhere, and particularly our, our guest, Antonio Sol. It's uh, really an honor and a pleasure to, to be here with you, but also to represent this intercontinental uh, conversation uh, across the, the arts to politics and, and, and back. So welcome to everyone and, and, and thanks for the people who've arranged this. It, perhaps by way of introduction, and so you, you might say a word about your parents. You, you, when, when you're asked, how you got to do all the things that we just heard that you do as a TV uh, person, radio, actor, songwriter, uh, musician, activist. Um, the answer that you most often give is my parents. Can you say a word about who they were and what they were to you? Well, first it's an honor to be here. I mean, your accolades are just, <laughs> they're off the, the roof of the chart. It really is an honor. And I thank CGC Nairobi for always, you know, placing me on a pedestal. But I, I think for my, my mom is still an educator. I mean, she's taught for more than 25 years um, and teaching preschool. 
my dad worked in a circle, um, you know, that helped Kenya police to get loans. Uh, basically, that's what he did. Um, and I, it, it's quite interesting because my, they were disciplinarians, they were very strict people. But I feel like once they realized that there was a sort of artistry within me, they couldn't, they just couldn't stop the train. So if, I, I, I thank my parents for that. I mean, my parents were the people who, my mom would hold a microphone for me when I was performing in church. And my dad would be the one taking the photos, you know? There's all these, there's, if you watch some of what my latest music video, you'll see a video of me in 1989 as a kid. Um, I don't, I don't come from a well-off family, but like my dad was so insistent that he had to capture those moments, no matter how expensive that would be. So, I mean, you could tell that they knew there was something about me. Um, so for that, I generally do appreciate them a lot, but they're quite strict. I mean, my parents didn't care that I could sing the highest voice. All they cared about was that if I was going to sing, then I was going to be good in school. Then I was going to make sure I work at home. Like, so there was that discipline and that order. I, I thank them for creating it because I feel it's, it's the same thing that I have now. My mom tells a story of how she, when she was pregnant with me, in fact, she says, she says she gave this to me, sort of like a blessing and a curse that when she was pregnant with me, she was always working. And so when she gave birth to me, in fact, I'm, of my siblings, I'm the one who came out the fastest. <laughs> because I, she, I couldn't wait to, I couldn't wait to leave, uh, you know, and immediately I left, I started working all my life, you know, when I was in grade five, I was performing for then president, you know, for Cardinal Maurice Otunga. I mean, there's so much that I've ended up doing um, that really shows that that order that they, create, that they gave me is the reason why I still do what I do. Do you think it's accurate to say accurate that? To say that because your mother is a teacher, is a teacher, is that so? Mm -hmm. um, that with your art, with your art, you want to be disciplined and you want to present yourself a certain way uh, that the that the school teacher would look at it and say, "That's my son over there." But also, you're you're a teacher yourself. Are you are you? Do you think about it that way yourself? And you're, part of your job as an artist is to teach. Yeah, I mean, it's um for me, I find it inevitable. Um, I always use, I love using the phrase that uh, art and, you know, we talk about politics and, and, and teaching, so to say, um, and activism, they're inextricably intertwined. You cannot have, and, and for me, it's two things. One, because of the background that I come from, I mean, the, the kind of mom that I have, we're talking about someone who I've seen dedicate all her life with so much passion and enthusiasm for helping other people's children but you know when you really think about it you ask yourself why why would you why would you want to teach for such a mega earning and and for so long and for all your life but for her it was really is a calling but then also because of where i come from i come from a very difficult background i mean i come from the slums uh, a place called kawangware you know i make fun and i say that it's got a really bad name i mean you have to be from my tribe to understand where I come from and what the name is. So the way I come from a place called Gatina, <laughs> which, which basically means, for lack of a better word, small ass. That's just what it is. So <laughs> growing up, I think until you get older, you realize that that is the image of where you come from. This is who you are. That is your reality. There must be something more for myself and for other people who come from where I come from. And the least that I can do with my fame is that I don't have to feed off of the fame like a tick that eats and eats itself and will die with the blood that it's sucked from. There must be more than I can give because of being able to make it. I mean, I've made it more than most, most people that I grew up with. So there must be more that I could have done with, that, with my art. And that's why for me, it's very important that whether it's on my, when I'm on TV, whether I'm on radio, whether it's through the music, that there must be something to be taught. That's what I believe. Let me ask you, uh, to, uh, ask you uh, for a moment about your father. father. Uh, you describe him as a businessman and as a, as a theologian. theologian. And I was very struck by that, especially uh, listening to certain, uh, certain pieces of yours where there is 
a prayerful aspect, a uh, kind of praising of of, of 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 the of God in your work. Is is that part of that? Is that throughout your work that, that that's that you're a teacher, but you're also in a sense your daddy's own son as a as a preacher's kid. Actually, no. I mean, I feel for for me getting to that realization of wanting to um, to praise God in some of the songs that I have and to really thank God is because one is because of my background, and I feel my journey has also been the same with my dad because my dad found his Damascus way later in his life. I mean, he'd enjoy it. <laughs> my dad, I I I always have funny stories of my family. So. My dad used to really drink. And so because, again, where I come from, he used to sing. Like, he'd start singing, like, like when I talk about miles, I'm talking about, like, miles away. He used to sing. So if there was any thieves around him, they'd think he was, like, a madman. So that, that's, that's, that's the kind of dad I know. I mean, he used to sing, and he'd sing Kikuyu songs, and he'd, he'd pretend he's, like, crazy, so he'd get to the house. So he was never really that prayerful guy, but I feel he, he met his Damascus. And I, for me, I've always been a church boy. I mean, my mom used to go to church. I, I helped my church choir to win, to win, you know, competitions, um, you know. So that always happened for me. But I feel for me it's important. And the thing for me about my art is it's very important for me to not be pretentious. And it's important for me to have a stand. So I know a lot of people will be very quick to say they don't believe in God. They don't understand, you know, the science science trumps you know religion but that's just who i am so for me i know that there's a god and it's important for me to also show that um yeah and my and i also love that my dad is proper theologian like he knows the bhagavad gita he knows the quran he knows the bible and he will never he will never stop and tell me oh you shouldn't get tattoos it's against religion so for me that's what also makes me love religion in the sense that he's been a good example of how religious people should live their lives which is there mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. so when we hear you sing lion of judah we can hear that, that sense of, of, of that, that background of uh, booming through uh, by the way we can also hear at, at one point uh, you, you describe your music one way uh, and then you say I don't know, man. My music is a salad. It's, it's a lot of different things. And then elsewhere, someone will say, say he's a reggae artist. Can you put the, the reggae part of it? Or what do you think of these labels anyway? So the thing about reggae is it's very difficult for me to run away from reggae music. Um, one of the reasons is because I grew up um, again in Kongwari. So I know, I know this part of the conversation will come later, but I grew up in, I was born in 1985. So I was born three years after the attempted coup in Kenya. The three years after the attempted coup in Kenya, on, on the day when the coup happened, the guys who attempted to uh, attempted the coup were in uh, the national broadcaster. And what they did was they told the presenter to move away from the normal music and play reggae music. So the, our president then, President Moi, then saw that there was a connection between the rebellion and reggae music. So he actually sort of silent, it was like a silent ban, but he silently banned the reggae music in Kenya. But during the advent of the likes of Lucky Dube, you know, and obviously Bob Marley, you really couldn't keep reggae down. But so now reggae music was used as an underground music because of its messaging, but mostly because to the uh, used by the people and listened to by the people in the slums where I happened to come from. So I grew up with uncles who um, my father's brothers were not, uh, the, the youngest, were not that far off from me in terms of age. Um, so I grew up with them and then we'd hang out together and I'd listen to reggae music. So I, uh, by the time I started singing Neo Soul and all this r and I have tried to run away from reggae, <laughs> but it just doesn't happen. I mean, and the thing about reggae is that it's very simple and easy to use to send messages. So like for me, Lion of Judah, the thing about Lion of Judah, it's, uh, this is the, the thing I love about my music is that I never really tell people what I'm trying to sing in my music. I let them to get it from themselves. But the thing also about Lion of Judah is that I'm not only singing about what is the proverbial Lion of Judah, but I'm also singing to a creed of kings and queens 
hoping they understand that they come from descendants who we believe were actually kings and queens. So, uh, I mean, until you really get to understand the music, then you understand some of the low-line messages that I have there. They say in Kenya that I'm the only one who's ever sung a song um, like Sense Emilia to actually advocate for the legalization of marijuana. And mm. no, like nobody, I didn't get fired from the job. I mean, people didn't even realize what I was doing, but <laughs> that's what I was doing. So it's important for me to use reggae in that sense because it's, it also travels very fast when you use reggae music. But all in all, I think I would say I'm just a soulful artist. I'm a soul artist. I'm, mm. I'm an all-round artist who can sing reggae, who can sing neo-soul, and who maybe one day when I get older, I'll probably sing opera just so, just so I can confuse them more. <laughs> can you say just a word about, a uh, word about, uh, about your name? About your name. Uh, I bet your friends, your I bet your mother calls you Anthony. Calls you Anthony. Yeah. So, but 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 the, but you have a professional name. Where did you get that? So my name is Anthony Mwangin Dongo. Unfortunately for me, this is this is gonna sound very wrong, but I generally do not know. <laughs> I've I've asked around, and I mean my, my names are quite um. My second name, my second Kikuyu name, which is my first name, is quite popular. So I don't really know what it means. Ndongo my, is my family name. Anthony Mwangi Ndongo. Um, so there's that. But Antonio Soul, this is how it came about. 2001 or two there about when I was in high school, um, there was there was a free-to-air station called Channel O. Channel O is a South African station, free-to-air station that was showing on Kenyan TVs. And I mean, you know, in my time, you'd have to go over on, on top of the roof and move the aerial so you could just be able to watch TV. So they, at that particular point, they were only playing new soul music on the free-to-air channel. It was during the advent of R&B moving into neo soul and using neo soul to sort of change and redefine and re revolutionize R&B so it could continue to be consumed. So at that time, the likes of D'Angelo, Maxwell, Erica Badu, um, you know, all these, Ken Latimo, all these great artists, those are Shade. So, and Shade has always been there for a while, but I mean, in terms of that free to air station, I really consumed a lot of Neo Soul. So for me, it became like a school that I was going to without even realizing that I was shifting my, 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 my voice and my psyche and my energy towards that. I mean, when you listen to people like Erica Badu once, you can't stop listening to her. So mm -hmm. I'd go to events, you, you can't. I'd go to events and I'd get up on stage and this is in church. So I'd get up on stage and I don't have original compositions at that time. And I, and I have to find, I'm like, oh my God, what am I gonna sing? So, <laughs> so I'd, I'd end up remixing some of these songs like uh, Erica Badu's Bag Lady, and I'd be there singing, Sing a lady, you can get yourself Driving all them scenes like that I guess nobody ever told you That you go to hell If you don't, don't Stop singing it. So, pay the light. I mean, so, so, wow. people didn't, they didn't, they didn't get like, what, what, what is this? What are you saying? And it's so cool, but it's so, we've never heard of this. And I'm like, oh, I became a messenger and an ambassador for Neo Soul music. I tell everyone about this genre of music called Neo Soul. When the hosts and MCs of events started calling me up to go on stage, they started saying, so, up next is Anto. The Neo Soul guy. And then one time, someone, I can't remember who, but one time went on, someone went on stage and said, Anto Neo Soul. And that's how the name stuck. So they didn't know that I was telling them about something that existed. They thought that I came up with the name Neo Soul. And how the name, yeah. At the beginning of your career, correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of your songs were about problems in personal relationships. My yeah. girl is gone and I lost my uh, blue. And then you just 
went to do other things. Can you talk about a kind of shift between that early material and, and what you've been yeah. doing lately? I mean, <laughs> I, I had, um, I had, a, I had, a I was, I was pretty in love when I was in university to a girl, some girl, I can't, I don't want to say her name, but it, it was like, I think my first true love, that one, I think was my first true love. So most, when we broke up, because my, my cousins had met her, you know, and they'd always be like, yo, you better marry this one. This is like, this is a girl. Like this is, you know, when people, when they, sometimes when people know that's the one for you, like if you, if you don't, if you mess up, it's gone. So, um, so I feel like when we broke up, so a lot of the music that I was creating really came from an Adele point of view. So where it was really honest, heartbroken, and people need to fix. I was trying to fix people's relationships through my music. And then I, at that point also was sort of, I think, our prime in terms of our sexual prime, me and my friends, because then everybody was in a relationship. People were having, you know, there was a thing called uh, Chips Funga, which is one night stand. And it was like a, it was like a, it was like a thing. You know how TikTok is a thing now in Kenya. It was a thing. Like, have you had a one night stand? Like, you should. So I ended up singing against it because it was like, guys. I mean, yeah. do you realize? You know this. So that's the song that actually helped me to blow up. And then the next song was Quarty Love. You know, when you meet someone online and you don't really know each other and you end up being friends. When Facebook moved from high school friends or university friends to hooking up. So I ended up using those opportunities um, about music. But then I, I guess I shifted and I changed. I mean, one of the things about me is I'm quite rebellious to a fault in the sense that when people expect me to continue doing that kind of music, I will go away, not to piss them off, but because I generally do not like when people decide to drive a certain conversation for me. So I end up, mm -mm, I'm not going to do love songs anymore. I know you like them, but I won't do them just because I, just because you guys want them, I'm not going to do them. It's the same thing with my dreadlocks. One of the reasons why I got the dreadlocks is because people would always talk about, you can see the, 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 the photo there, the paint in the back. People would always tell me about, oh, I love your hair. I love it when it's short, when it's tall, when it's long. So I, I made choices to not give people that power that they end up deciding for me what I should sound like and where I should go just because they think it fits me. Yes, and I was very struck by that song, Chips Funga, I mean, uh, because you expect it to be one night stand. Hey, let's go get it. And it really isn't that. It's like, hey, you know what? This yeah. Isn't, this isn't so cool. You know, that's, it's yeah. really, it's, it's, it's a very striking decision. Yeah. You also say elsewhere that your narrative, you, you come from a modest background, as you've said, from the Katina. Did I say that right, yeah. Katina? Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> He said, that is my narrative. And I, yeah. I think, can you say another word about that, about the, the, the idea that you come from a specific background? That's the yeah. story. The reason why I own it now is because of a very interesting story. When I was in, my grandfather, um, I think, worked, he worked for the government uh, a bit. He was actually, he was, he was in the military. Um, he's, he's the first person in my life that I saw with the, the tattoo of a lion. There's a certain green tattoo that people in the military will get. Um, so he was at the forefront of, you know, of the African rifles when they were fighting World War II. So he, fortunately, I, I, I think fortunately, he was very keen and very big on education. Even before I could be a school going kid, he would make me read the newspaper and he'd he'd doze off as I was reading and then he'd wake up and when I stopped and he'd be like, why are you stopping? And I was quite a young kid, but he, and he, looking back now, he was also very clear. My father went to a very sort of low primary school, but he got good education. But I went to a better institution because of my grandfather's decision for me to go to that school. He was very clear about me going to the school. It's called Lovington Primary School. Lovington Primary School um, introduced me to, to very many things that when I look back now, I really thank the school for. Um, one of the reasons why I'm eloquent, um, you know, in terms of my identity, in terms of, I, I saw a few things about discrimination. I learned a lot about that school. Um, I had a teacher, I had a teacher in grade three. She was, uh, she was Indian. She was called Miss Chana. She would never touch the black kids. She would, when she was punishing us, 
she would hit us with a ruler on our knuckles because, and I mean, I, I learned this, the more I thought about it later, because I, I noticed that other teachers would spank us and, you know, uh, corporal punishment. I mean, that time, in my time, it was it was legal, but she wouldn't touch the black kids. So you, you don't notice these things until you get older and you're like, why was she that way? Why was it that she could never pinch us? She could never, you know, she just didn't want any interaction with us. And so the more I thought about that, the more I thought about where I came from, and the fact that it makes you very aware of who you are. But also quite unfortunately is that when I go home and I go to school, I live on the side of the slum that is close to the bougie side, which is Lavington. So, and you can even hear the name Kawangware is, uh, it's basically, uh, it means Kawangare. There was a lady who had a shop, but they couldn't pronounce the name. I think some white guy or someone could pronounce the name. So it ended up becoming Kawangware. It sounds very, local. Lavington sounds like a white guy, you know, British guy. The people that I schooled with throughout my life there thought that when I was going home, I was actually still going back to Lavington, not realizing that I, I had to use Lavington to get home because we were bordering the, the, the bougie place. The, so, I mean, we had to use, and wh wherever there's a bougie place, there's always a slum. That's just how it is. So until I got out of school, and I'm talking about high school, this, when I started realizing that it's very important, when people would ask me, because when you start off as an artist, they ask you, where do you come from? You know, they want to know who are you? Like, what's your story like? And you, you, you tell them I come from Kawangware, and they don't believe. And the way I speak, the way that I carry myself, the way that I adorn myself, they just don't get it. Like, how are you from Kawangware? Uh, why are you why how have you been able to get these opportunities and i'm like hmm? I, I didn't get it so i started to understand that yes i did come from kawangware but there was also a certain level of privilege that i had because of the schooling that i went to and because of my grandfather's influence in being able to even get me into that school so that i cannot take away from that privilege because i come from a lineage of landlords my great great grandfather is a senior chief. These are people who collaborated with the, with the colonialists. So there is privilege there. And, but it's important for me to remind people where I come from and to state it very clearly because that is my truth. It is my narrative. But also most importantly, again, it's a moment, a teachable moment that look at me and where I come from, it's very important. I always say, and I always feel very blessed that I have, I host one of the biggest shows in Kenya on Friday at 10 p.m. It is a show that the who's who and everybody wants to come on. You cannot leave any country in Africa and go and come to Kenya without coming to that show if you're going to do a media tour. So when the kids watch me and they know that he comes from the slum and he comes from where I come from, that to me is the highest level of servitude that I can give back to my people. So it's very important. And I must own, I must own my fluency and I must own my poverty that I have. It's, it's beautifully said, and it certainly comes through in the music. You can feel the kind of passion that you have at 360 degrees. And, and uh, I wonder if you can say a moment uh, another word about Kenya as a nation and its mm. own march toward a more free state, a more democratic uh, sense of things. You've already talked about the bougie, the kind of class problem, yeah. holding yeah. things together. Uh, how are we doing on that continuum now? And what would you say to the government or to the to the people about how Kenya is doing? Yeah, I, I mean, we're still we're still on the process of recovering from what I like to call colonial hangover. The wow. thing, the thing about um, <laughs> the thing about a, a hangover is, I mean, all the people who are watching, we've all had a hangover one time in our life. Even if it's just a love hangover, where you or a decision you've made, and you wake up in the morning and you're like, oh my goodness, I will never do that again. It makes me sick. It is disgusting. So that is what Kenya is undergoing through now. We're at a point of colonial hangover. And the thing about colonialism is that it was a vessel of empires 
or the empire, the, the British empire that lacked any morality and lacked any empathy. Colonialism was period, for lack of a better word, it was violent, period. So that violence that was meted on black people, on my people, the violence that cut the heads of the older people, we continue to pierce the souls and cut the roots and the feet of our own people with the classism that we have, with the injustice that we have, with the, and especially when you look at the people who fought for our independence, and when we look at the people who we call our founding fathers, but were not really our founding fathers, they ended up becoming our founding fathers because they could speak English and were used by the system to continue to propagate the powers and the privilege and the injustice meted on by the white British colonialists. They were put there in place so as to continue with the empire, the works of the empire. And let's not forget that the empire was a business. And when I say it didn't have any empathy, is that it doesn't care about the people. So when you look about, when you look at land injustices, for example, the people who fought for the freedom of this nation were not given back their land as was expected. The most productive land was taken by the political class. And I dislike, and I will not use the word elite because I feel elitism also comes with a level of uh, responsibility. So they are not elites. We like to call, we say, like to say political elite. We elevate them where we shouldn't elevate them. So the political class, that's what they are. Mm. They took their land that they were not meant to take. They bought that land at very cheap prices. They took away from our people and our people continue to suffer because of those injustices that were meted upon them then. But now I feel to Either the envy and the happiness of the white colonialists con were continued down again and passed down and inherited by our own Africans who continue to do this to black people. Now, when you look at small things like the police, for example, so we had what we called um, the guards. And these guards were, you know, they were wearing the shots and they had a level of power that was given by the white people. It is the same mentality that has been passed on from the whites to Africans that is now between Africans and Africans, where your physical outlook determines your political outcome or your physical out outlook determines your outcome period. The way that you look, how dark your skin is, where you come from, how you're dressed, they can tell. How your nose is shaped, because they can know the kind of tribe that you come from. Your name, there's a thing called the ID card that we walk with every single time we walk. In the time of the colonialists, it was called Kipande. At the height of the Mau Mau War, it was called Kipande. And my grandfather and everybody else had to walk around with this Kipande to prove that they were registered by the government and that they were not part of the Mau Mau. We continuously do that now and with a tinge of, of classism because when I, where I live now, I rarely see the police disturbing and stopping the young people who live here because they might be, people, they might be the children of the who's who. But from where I come from, it is the common norm that they will stop these young people, that they will ask them for their ID cards the same way that the guards and the white people did on our people. And this continues even with our education that they do not provide opportunities, that they take away the arts and they take away extracurricular activities so that our kids cannot question the institutions. You even hear and you see comments by older people saying, and we've had, for example, we've had a big issue now in Kenya of kids banning schools. There's been a very big issue of unrest in, in Kenya in high schools. So far, we're talking about 35 schools that have been banned by kids. We've had scenarios where kids have gone to the, to the, to the, the principals and said, we are going to walk out. So we don't want to ban the school. Let's just walk out. And we're not even listening to the kids. We're continuously telling the children that they shouldn't 
they shouldn't argue with the institutions because that is the same thing that happened in the time of the colonialists, that you don't question the institution. You don't question the empire. You do not study hard enough for you to question the empire. So we have, uh, we have a population that has so many bright people, that has so many uh, uh, fluent people and eloquent people, but without the bravery and the confidence to question, to revisit, to rethink, to recreate, to innovate, that's the people that we lack in this country. And so it, it feels to me that, I mean, the hangover has been there for long and it is bad. It, 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 for me now, it feels like we're like goats chewing the card. We spit mm -hmm. it out and spit it back in, and especially when it works in people's favor. And so for me, we have a long way to go. We generally do have a long way to go. We're talking about a president who still seated in power, who was part of the Pandora Papers, who promised that he would, he would come back and address why his family were involved in moving money to all these Caribbean islands and whatever. And he came back and didn't say anything about it. We're talking about uh, presidents generally even in Africa who go to these EU uh, meetings and the COP26 and all these things for, for lack of a better word, for photo ops. Mm -hmm. I mean, they don't have to be, they don't have to convene in the, in the idea that they have to convene in Europe to create solutions where they are part of the solution, the problem here. And I'm going to call out, for example, our, our, uh, our family, our first family, where when we talk about land injustices, there's been a very big issue surrounding his father, the first president of this country, and land injustices. And I mean, we talk about things like the environment and people facing droughts in certain parts of this country, yet that family has got the largest chunks of property and land that you could ever think of in this country, and the most arable, the most productive. So how are we ever gonna get out of this colonial hangover when we're not even honest with ourselves and not honest with our people and you're still in power. So yeah. you serve the drink, you don't drink it, but I get high and I have to deal with the consequences of getting sick from the highness. Well, your, your metaphor of a colonial hangover is very, it's pertinent all over the globe. And, and I think it's, 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 it's something we all have to wrestle with. I wonder if, if um, and by the way, we've talked about the artist and calling people out, and I, that, that's something that's so admirable. Just to, to say, you know, I've got this this megaphone. I'm I'm going to call people out high and low. So so just so just get get ready for it. Yeah. The thing that you do in interviews and elsewhere is talk about Kenyans that you do admire a lot. Sometimes your family members, and sometimes musicians. And sometimes you talk about the Mau Mau. Uh, sometimes you talk about the Kalenjin people. I, yeah. I wonder if, you, if you if you were gonna you have a big show addressing teens, mm. and if you're gonna say now we're gonna do a show that uplifts the the the, the, the beauty of being Kenyan. What what, yeah. would, what what would those what would be presented in shows like that? Who would be some of the heroes you'd bring forward? Mm, I mean, for me, one of the greatest heroes that I I talk about a lot has to be Wangari Maasai Nobel laureate. Um, growing up so uh, when i was growing up during her time um i would see her i started to watch her when there was now an advent of extra like tv tv station that we would watch her on i mean without the internet so the the, the memories were very vivid because i mean you didn't have to go look for them you know you didn't have to find them she didn't have to go viral is that she was on her face and i i see images of her at Karura Forest, and you could literally see a part of her hair out, and she's bleeding. And she is standing up to men with machetes and, and all sort of, sort of crude weapons. And she's on her own with her team, and she is she's asking them head on, why are you allowing yourself to be used to destroy this country? And one of the reasons why Nairobi is, is relatively still a bit green is because of Wangari Maasai. Um, so the idea that a woman of that nature would stand up to the 
to the institution, to the system that way, for me was so admirable. And she also stood up against our second president and she stopped him and his party from building the tallest, what they thought would be the tallest building on public property, on public land that was meant to be used as a recreational facility for the for the, at least the common guy who would go there and chill out with the girlfriend, chill out with the family, you know, draw a boat and have fun. They wanted to build the national the headquarters for the company, the, for their party there. So I bring her up a lot because, and also because she talks about your little thing, that small thing that is important to you, that is of interest to you, you should nurture it and, and water it and make it your thing so everybody can know you for that. So I bring her because of standing for who she is and also because she's a woman. You know, sometimes they call me feminist, sometimes they don't. It's, it's important that women get to see and hear stories of someone like her, but it's also more important for men to realize and understand that without the prejudice that we serve women on a silver platter day in, day out, that when we take that away, we shower them with love. This is what we water. We water people who are understand themselves, who take, who love nature, who are very concerned about the environment and concerned about the future of this country. So people like that who, for me, in post-colonial Kenya, who would do anything to fight for this country are people who I want the teenagers and the youth to hear about. I want them to hear about the likes of Eric Wainaina, a Berkeley uh, School of Music alumni who, you know, sang a song, literally calling out the government for what it was and calling out the government for corruption and lost so many endorsements, lost so many jobs, lost so many opportunities, but he sacrificed so that he could speak the truth. I will call out the likes of Kemboi, the likes of the late Tirop, the likes of, I feel for me, of Hussein um, Ibrahim, who was the first Kenyan to run the New York Marathon and open the floodgates for all the Kenyans that we see now. He recently just got, um, uh, he just got his uh, uh, hall, hall of Fame. He got, a, you know, an Athletes Hall of Fame. Um, he got an award for that. And I mean, he's a recipient of that. So people like those are quite important for me because of when you look at the Kalen gene, people have tried to study them and understand them. But I think it's a very simple answer if you ask me, who is, what is it about them? They are, apart from their physique, they are quite resilient. These are the runners that, that have won all the prizes, first, second, yeah. third. <laughs> yeah, and, first, and, and the seventh and eighth probably just let the first, second, and third <laughs> just yeah. make it this time. You know, I mean, they've, they, to me, are the best ambassadors that we have of this nation. There's a thing about their tribe, the Kalenjin. They are quite, you know, I mean, you always meet a, a you know, a Kalenjin who's lit and energetic like I am, but most of them are quite very chilled out people, very cool, calm, collected, and very calculative uh, in terms of their art and their craft. They're people who, you know, they come from, they come from a background where it's their main uh, source of living is farming, you know, and they come from cold, a cold place. They farm. And the thing about farming, and also when you think about even running, it sort of has the same behavior. You make hay while the sun shines. So you prepare your body, mind, and spirit for running. Then you, you have to plant, you have to seed at a certain time. So even for them, they prepare themselves to run at a certain time. They have a certain discipline that they have. And you only reap awards. The, the fruits if you've put in all this work so i mean people like that for me oh mm. my goodness that is the so admirable and to make things even better is that even after they've done this for the country and after they've won and gone and really put kenya out there is that you will rarely if ever meet a kalenjin runner marathon a record breaker who is full of themselves ever mm. never they are rich, they are wealthy, these guys, and you will never see themselves showing off and doing all these things. So I feel that's admirable because it is the essence of what a human being should be. That even as you win, you win with morality and you win with empathy for those who've even lost. And maybe as, as, we, as we come toward a close and as we invite our, our audience to come up with questions, 
empathy and what was your other key word morality morality i think yeah. for us to think about i want i want to i do want to ask you this now any you, you come from a background of film i mean you're, you're mm -hmm. a singer you're an actor you're you're television and radio personality but you're a film guy and yeah one, one thing that 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 strikes me about looking at your videos is that you refuse to do you have yeah. a politics of refusal you're not just going to show the light skin uh honeys dancing in the background you're going to yeah. show all the honeys and all the colors yeah. and with an emphasis on darker skin brothers and sisters can you say another yeah. word about that the reason I do that is because for me, blackness, blackness has become a veil. Blackness is a veil that people decide to take and remove as they wish. Blackness is a fetish that certain white people have, that it is a thing that they look at and they want to understand and they want to photograph and they want to include in conversations. They want to have on the red table talk so they can talk about it, you know, and move on. It is also a fetish because it is, it's a quota. You want to have that conversation so you can feel a puzzle and look fitting and befitting as a corporation. It is also a fantasy that, you know, a lot of people uh, would like to know what it means to be black. So they, that's why you have blackface and you have all these things. But the thing that people forget about being black is that it is a reality for black people, for African-Americans, for people of color. It is the baggage that they have to carry from the years of misinformation, of disinformation, of racism, of colorism. It is a baggage they have to carry day in, day out. I do not walk out of my house and decide to be lighter to make my world lighter. I am born black. So I have to carry the darkness that comes with everything surrounding what it means to be a black person. So it's important for me that I cannot be seen and I cannot be looked at in history as having to be a man, an African man with the influence and with, an, with a platform, and that I use that platform to still take away from the dark-skinned African woman and take away their voice by not representing them as it should be on, in my terms. Yes, there is a thin line between what I do and colorism, because you could also argue that what about light-skinned women? Does it mean that they shouldn't be represented? But also I could say, they have been represented. That's they true. have been at the presentation. We must, I grew up in a society where when I look around, I look at my mom's sisters, they are mostly dark skinned. That was the image that I saw. So why is it that, I'm, that it is so easy for me to shed my blackness and not represent them in my music videos? I have a responsibility to the young, dark-skinned girls who love my music, who love me as a person, who listen to me to see themselves. If they don't see themselves, and if I don't do it, I always say, then who will? So it's very important for me to now not say that we can, sh because we can never shed off the blackness that we have, but to now own it and adjust that crown as we see fit on and in our own terms. Maybe the last thing I want to say is many of the people watching here now and looking at you are thinking to themselves, look at this beautiful man. Look at those <laughs> rings. Look at that hair. Look at the beautiful <laughs> smile, the shirt. Can you talk, Zora Neale Hurston talks about what she calls the will to adorn. Yeah. Thing. Can, you, can, can you talk about the, 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 the world that, through which you move with such style and adorn? Yeah. Um, I, 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 I don't have a dalliance with boredom. I don't even, I don't even tread with <laughs> boredom. I, <laughs> for me, no dalliance with boredom. So, um, I, the, the thing I love about time is that time, time allows you to see things in a very different light. 
Um, I have a tattoo of Deren Kimathi, who's a field marshal, Deren Kimathi, Mau Mau uh, war veteran. Uh, there's a certain knowledge that I know about him that I cannot even say here um, because I only know about this knowledge because it is information passed down from the family to, uh, to the sculptor, the sculptor who, who created his, his amazing culture on Kimathi Street, which is also where I work. So that piece of information is quite shocking because it's something to do with his body that the family knew, but the image that we have of him is a very interesting image. And the reason why, and the more, I, and when I was told about the story, and on, by, by the way, the interesting thing about the guy who sculpted his, his, um, his image and everything on Kimathi Street has only one hand. The artist has one hand. So, so very many things come into play with that. Is that the image that we have of Deren Kimathi is the image of a man lying on the floor with his hands like this, sort of covered because he'd been shot and obviously shot and betrayed by one of our own for very few shillings. He'd been shot and he was covered and it was his dying moments. And that's the image that the colonialists ensured that they put out out there. But the image that we have of Deran Kimathi on the street of Kimathi Street is the image of an upstanding man holding his rifle and looking to the horizon as he sought out for the freedom of my people. It is very important for me that I adorn myself, that I, when I wear brass and I wear copper and I wear gold, and I wear all these things, it's very important for me and the people who look at me to not only see me wearing it, adorning myself, but to see me adorning myself with confidence and with the intention that I am not just a living being that you interact with, but I come from a lineage that I believe is of kings and queens. I might be very wrong, but that is my reality now. And it there's a thing that it comes with. It it comes with rather than rather than entitlement. It comes with the title. It doesn't come with entitlement because the reality on the ground is different. But the title comes with a sense of responsibility that the knowledge that I instill myself, that the things that I say, that the way I carry myself, that my music videos, that the things that I write, that how I dress must allow people to address one another as kings and queens. One of the things that I've been doing recently is when I speak to a man, I'll say, yes, king. And when I speak to a woman, I'll say, yes, queen. It's mm. very important that we propagate and we continue to instill these things within ourselves because we carry the burden of our past without the knowledge that it comes with. And so we continuously have to deal with the consequence of our past. But if we decide that we can create a different future for ourselves in the present by deciding that this is who I am and not what you say of me. It means that in the future, when we will be the past, that that present will be of them writing about kings and queens who came before us, who were called Anto, who were called John, who were called Lucy, who were called Brian, because the story they will write is a story of kings and queens. And when they document the imagery and the videos and everything, we will look like kings and queens. That's very important for me. Mm -hmm. So beautifully said, beautifully said. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm working on an artist from Ari Bearden. And he said that part of his job as a black artist was to look at, um, the poorest person that you'd see on the street and see a king or a queen there. Mm. And also to look at the president or the vice president, whoever has the high office, the richest people in the world, and see mm. a person who's just on a, just another human too. And to be mm -hmm. able to see, to see that it's all one family. In, 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 in. Yeah. And the difference here is probability. I mean, one of the reasons why I always end my radio show by telling guys, God bless you, be nice, be kind. One of the reasons why I always end with those that phrase, be nice, be kind, is because I learned from uh, a very good friend of mine who's, uh, who, who heads Google in Sub-Saharan Africa. And he told me, he's called Charles, he told me, Anto, the difference between you and the waiter 
is probability. Because he's sort of like my mentor. So we're having a conversation about a certain waitress and he spoke to her and, and, and told her, oh, wow, you gave birth. Hey, how is the kid now? And I asked him, huh? How did you even know that information about her? Like, did you, how do you even remember that, that the kid was born? And he told me, Anto, because even in my privilege, I have to remember the difference between me and the next person is probability. So I'm a very, I'm very big on. That's why I said I, I don't mind people being religious, but I, I, I mind people being uh, quite kind and honest one another. So for me, probability is a very big deal. That the person with a motorcade of, you know, I mean, uh, not to throw any shade, but people at uh, at the climate change uh, conference with eight a motorcade of a hundred cars, while they discuss, you know, the effects of <laughs> the effects you know of carbon emissions and they're out there you know driving these big cars to me that person could easily be the guy that is checking out my luggage in a supermarket so we have to be kind to one another we have to i'm very big on empathy we have to be nicer to each other we, we have uh, several uh, questions and comments and i tell you what i'm going to do is i'm going to i'm going to read the three that are here in front of me and ask okay. you, I'll just read them all and then you can respond if you will to, to whatever oh, part. The first one cool. just says, we look forward to hearing you sing opera, I have time. <laughs> <laughs> and the second one says, are there any aspects of traditional cultures in Kenya prior to the colonial regime that you feel can inspire the future of Kenyan identity? Mm -hmm. And the third one, there's a relationship here is, you are such a brave and bold artist. How did you arrive at that level of wisdom? And what wow. advice can you give to young people today? Cool. So, um, I mean, let's start with the first one. I'm just having them down here. Oprah, yeah, one day. I think one day. Like, I'm Yay. seeing really hard. So, <laughs> well, you know, Aretha, Aretha, just, if, you, if you Google Aretha and opera, yeah, Pavarotti couldn't make it, and so here I am, and she rings the rafters. So let Louis yeah. Armstrong would sing Pagliacci, you know. So we, 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 we're I'm gonna, ready. I'm gonna challenge CGC Nairobi. I've challenged CGC Nairobi for long. If you're not gonna get me to New York next year, please, guys, delete my number because this is this is why I wanna go to New York so I can try out opera. <laughs> Look me up. We'll, we'll work. We'll make it work. <laughs> cool. So um, yeah. So one day I will do that. Um, in terms of aspects of traditional culture that I mean could be used in the present, um, I feel for me one of them is storytelling. Storytelling is a very big aspect of traditional culture. Um, now my people are using uh, are using the adornment of traditional culture as a means to an end politically, in the sense that they go and collect or they have or they fund this elderly who dress up in traditional attire. And when a politician is seen with them, they sort of look like they've been coronated as the next leader or the leader that, that, that will represent that tribe. So they're using, uh, you know, they're using traditional attire for political satire, so to say, kind of thing. So for me, I think storytelling, I mean, our people would sit around the fire and be told stories of our people. And storytelling is very important we have to document. One of the reasons, I mean, when we think about Africa, the Africans and when you think about e Egyptians, we were the people, we came up, we came up with writing, we came up with mathematics, we were the, we were the first people to write and document and put these things on the walls, hieroglyphics and all that stuff. But because we didn't document them as they were documented when the colonialists came through, so it was very difficult to pass on this information to our people. Secondly, the vessel of the empire, that is colonialism, was very clear cut on, like I said at the beginning, on cutting the heads of my forefathers, of my people, because then they died, their heads died, full of library of information that cannot be passed down to me now. I don't know some of the songs that they sang. I would love to sing them. I'd love to interpolate them, but I cannot because that, that information I don't have. So storytelling, I think, is very important. We have to modernize it in terms of digitizing the information that we put out there, put it in schools, advocate for that to be in schools, but even teach our own kids who they are. That's very, very important. Um, and then someone's asked, how did I arrive? 
at this point and and what advice do I have is that and I think for me I am on the journey of really getting to to a place where I can I can be able to to honestly be as wise as the man who's hosting me today um and the reason I say that is because I think it's very important that we are very intentional about the information that we receive so we can be able to give we cannot give if we do not if we have nothing to give so for me it's it's quite um i'm quite intentional about it that i'm always i don't know maybe it comes from where i come maybe it's my grandfather great grandfather or someone who that i'm very clear clear cut and keen on being remembered for someone who had great intention and the best of hearts for you know for other people so i will say that yes it, there's a lot of bravery in that there's a lot of confidence the things that i say i've gotten in trouble at times with you know uh, with the system um i've never been arrested thankfully i've gotten in trouble you know by being told not to speak about certain issues on air da, 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 da. but i i mean i have to also poke to know how far can i poke so it's important for me to get that point i love to read a lot um i love to challenge myself um so yeah and i and i feel that i want to be remembered for that i don't want to just be any other person and the advice that i would give to um to to young to young people and also j- just to mention that a point before that is to listen um i think a lot of times when I, when i was younger i was quite haphazard i was all over the place um now i listen a lot i and by listening i mean when i don't hear people speak i really listen to them their body language their the things hidden in between the lines i read that a lot i will like for example this conversation we're having i will go and google uh, professor robert i will get to find out more about his works and i want to know more about him that is listening and you only get to that place if you also intentionally want that information and want to be there you can do that and the advice that i have to young people is is own your narrative and listen listen to your heart be honest in your craft be very kind to people because you just never know who you're crossing paths with and what difference and what they might do a change in your life it's very important for you to be nice to people because you just never know i think that for me is very important and take your time but you don't have all the time take your time but you don't have all the time so create recreate innovate challenge yourself go to that event read a book thrift a book thrift a jacket photograph it put a word out there ask questions ask 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 questions please remember to ask because only then will you learn and only then will you grow and where you can please give and give freely i give advice all the time my friends say that i would make a lot of money if i would do consultation work on certain things but then i also believe that there's there's the, the power and the gift of giving because then i have seen firsthand what giving does because i've received and i've received immensely so that for me is very important and be patient be patient the world is your oyster and if you really do take your time and work on your craft and work on yourself some of these things that look like a mirage to you they become just that a mirage they become oh i've been there done that yeah let's give our last uh question or the the invitation for you to have the last word uh roslyn olewe says thank you anto for your eloquent discourse do you uh foresee a kenyan sound that can be recognized as representative representing the kenyan story mm. i'm keen on koth biro sound and the late mm-hmm. ayub agadi or shem agada agada yeah do you see a sound that represents the kenyan story coming from the future first, first rosalyn is a very um, she's a she's a very important person in my life i've i've um, i did uh, i was a judge of a um, of a certain you know a talent show where she was head of production she was doing everything and you know i mean she's quite a phenomenal woman kudos to you thank you so much for being a part of this 
I, I don't, I generally do not foresee uh, Kenyan sound. And the reason is because it is quite, it is quite, uh, it's historical. When you look at the mess that colonialism left for us, and I mean, I don't want to feel like I'm berating the point and I keep talking about it, but when you look at how we ended up being segregated and, uh, and like I keep saying, they took away from our older people the, so that we could not be taught our ways, is that all that and the advent of obviously the revolu industrial revolution. And when we look at, uh, you know, just modernization, there's a lot that has changed that for me would take a very long time for us to understand what does it mean to be fully Kenyan? I think it's a question that we grapple with a lot. What I do foresee though, is a Kenyan audience. We do have a Kenyan audience, but we don't understand what it means to have a Kenyan audience. We have music by Kenyans. We like to compare ourselves with the West a lot. There is no American music. You cannot sit and tell me that this is American music. There is jazz, there is hip hop, there is trap, there is soul, there is folk music. Some of the music, the origin, yes, would be from America, would be from Native Americans, would be from African Americans. We talk about jazz, we talk about hip hop, yes. But the audience has learned to love the music regardless and be like moths to a flame, go to where the flame is. If your flame is jazz, then that becomes your poison. If your flame is hip hop, that becomes your poison. So unfortunately, I mean, I should be the biggest optimist, but I don't foresee a time where there'll be a certain sound and a certain feel or rhythm that is predominantly Kenyan. And we do have that kind of sound. Benga for me, the type of music is Benga, is very Kenyan. If we were to sort of have Benga in every style and, and, and rhythm and melody that we have in our music, then we would really call that Kenyan. But when we look at our upbringing and we look at uh, the, the artists that we have now, they have such difference, difference, uh, different difference in influences that they are not, uh, they're not forced to move a certain way just because that is music will be termed as Kenyan. So we have a long way to go. And I also feel that when we do love ourselves more than we think we do, then maybe we'll have Kenyan music only until we love ourselves. I think that is possible. And now I, I want to hand over to my colleagues, but before I do so, I, yeah. I want to say that um, I've so enjoyed your, your meditations on empathy and responsibility and on colonial hangovers and, uh, and uh, your refusal to dally uh, with boredom. This, this is great, but above all, you, you're, you're very nice and you're very kind. And we appreciate Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Robert. Before you go, I, it's been an absolute honor. Um, I mean, from the first time that, you know, we had the session with everyone on board to the emails that I've had with you. And 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 I think it's your PA who, <laughs> I have to tell this story. So your PA <laughs> he emailed me, but when I replied back, the email read my surname. And so she emailed back apologizing profusely for calling me Antonio Soul and not my surname. And when I replied back and said, no, 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 that's okay. You can call me anything. I mean, that's my name. She, I don't think she knew how to reply back. So please tell her that um, when, I, when I come to the States, I'll, I'll bring her something that is worn by women here just so she knows that everything is okay. But it's been an absolute honor and delight. Congratulations on your new book um, that I saw on your Instagram. I hope that I can get a cover, hard, hard copy, uh, here I'll order for my copy, but I hope I can get it in, in, uh, to well, Kenya. I'll send, you, I'll send you one as soon as it's out. Let's stay in touch. Awesome. It's been a pleasure. You've been such a delight, and um, it's been a, a pure honor to be in your presence. Thank you so much. The feeling is mutual. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both um, on behalf of Columbia Global Centers Paris and Nairobi and our partners, the American Library in Paris and the Institute for Imagination. We want to thank you both. It was just such a fantastic, engaging conversation. I know I learned a ton. Um, 
And thank you also to our international audience for joining us. And I hope that you can join us for our next conversation in the Entre Nous series, which will be this Wednesday, November 17th, with authors Lauren Elkin and Lauren Collins in conversation. We have more details about that on our website and also on the American Library in Paris' website. And uh, we'll have a video of this conversation up on our YouTube channel shortly. Thank you again. Thank you both. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a lovely and evening. Nairobi, thank you. My Nairobi people, thank you so much. Bye all. Bye. Bye.